Welcome to For the Record. I'm Margaret Popper. Jing Ulrich is chairman of China Equities at J.P. Morgan Chase. Born in China but educated at Harvard, Ulrich has a job that straddles the two worlds. She sells investment advice to Chinese clients, big ones like the Chinese government. Ulrich is angling for market share at a time when Chinese banks are coming into their own, and U.S. banks are fighting for their piece of the Chinese pie. U.S. banks have been in China for more than 100 years. J.P. Morgan opened branches in Shanghai and Tianjin in the 1920s. Citibank got there in 1902. After Mao Zedong kicked the bank out in 1949, it took 35 years to get back in. In 2006, the investment bank set up shop, led by Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley. There's an awareness of U.S. banks to really are great growth opportunities. Now, the financial crisis has put them off track somewhat. To pass the U.S. government stress test, Goldman sold 20% of its stake in China's biggest bank, the Industrial and Commercial Bank of China. It still owns more than 13 billion shares it can't sell until April. For the same reason, Bank of America sold a third of its stock of China Construction Bank. Now it's seeking a license to conduct wholesale banking in China. But the Chinese may not be so welcoming this time around. They don't really need capital. They're actually exporting capital at a tremendous rate. So what they're really looking for is expertise. As China's economy opens further, the demand for mergers and corporate finance will skyrocket. That's where firms like J.P. Morgan Chase may profit. The Hong Kong market is quite open to international investors and participation of foreign investment banks. So many of the Wall Street firms uh, have full licenses uh, to operate in Hong Kong so they can serve as uh, underwriters for Chinese companies going public in Hong Kong. They can certainly trade in the Hong Kong market with no problems. But in the mainland market in Shanghai and Shenzhen, foreign participation is still highly restricted. Uh, I would say uh, by and large, the domestic underwriting business has been pretty much done by domestic Chinese securities firms. Foreign participation only takes up a very small market share. You've seen Bank of America selling its stake in China Construction Bank because it had to, not because it wanted to. You've seen similar retractions at other large U.S. banking institutions. Is China going to let them back in if they want to up their stakes? Or is that it? These foreign strategic investors invested in Chinese banks before they went public. So this was uh, three to four years ago. And they got in at pretty attractive prices at the time. Since then, the Chinese banks have done very well after they got the listing, additional capital from portfolio investors. Now, going forward, I think Chinese banks really at this point don't need any additional capital. If they did, domestic capital would be more than ample to supply the Chinese banks. So at this juncture, I think if you look at the overall structure of the banking system, it is pretty much dominated by Chinese players. Foreign banks altogether account for about 1% market share. And it's going to stay that way, it sounds like. Well, you know, going forward, I think foreign banks will be expanding their branch networks. They will be certainly seeking uh, to do more underwriting business. Asset management firms are also expanding. A lot of them are China foreign JVs. Uh, however, I think foreign banks cannot rival the Chinese players in terms of penetration, in terms of the branch network. And J.P. Morgan's plans in the region? Well, we have uh, four branches in China right now, uh, in Shanghai, Beijing, Tianjin, and Guangzhou. We're about to open a fifth branch in uh, Chengdu in the f near future. There are a lot of underserved customers, both in corporates and among retail investors. We're also interested in tapping into uh, the very um, high-end um, high net worth individuals as well in China. Government um, sponsored investment funds are becoming more active on the world stage as well. So overall, if you look at the whole banking space, there's huge amounts of opportunities that uh, foreign banks can participate in. China's biggest banks have market caps of around $200 billion, double their American counterparts. But Chinese banks' net interest margins are lower than U.S. banks. That's the difference between what they pay to borrow money and what they get for lending it. Even so, Chinese bank stocks are trading at double the value of their assets, twice as high as U.S. banks. Do these Chinese institutions 
have the gas to justify that price to book. You know, Chinese banks are now among the largest in the world in terms of deposits, in terms of uh, their market cap, and just in terms of their overall branch networks. Um, of course, ICBC, the Industrial Commercial Bank of China, is the single largest bank in the world. Now, if you look at the net interest margins of Chinese banks, the situation is very different in China compared to the U.S. because interest rates in China are set by the central bank. So in the last um, uh, 12 months, interest rates have come down five times. The lending rates were cut more than the deposit rates. So Chinese banks' net interest margins went from 3.5 percent this time last year to about 2.5 percent today. But they're still very profitable. In fact, Chinese banks are among the most profitable banks in the world, even throughout the financial crisis in the last 18 months. And how do they achieve that? Well, you know, the Chinese banking system is relatively closed to foreign competition. Deposits in the Chinese banking system with household and corporate deposits combined amounted to some 8 trillion U.S. dollars. So if you look at the common measure of liquidity in the Chinese banking system, uh, which is the loan to deposit ratio, that's only 67 percent after new loans tripled in the first six months of the year. Welcome back to For the Record. Ulrich says the Chinese economy is 60 percent bigger than it was just two years ago. The stock market is up 90 percent this year alone. I asked her how long that kind of growth can continue. Well, you know, credit has been very, very important, not just to the Chinese economy, but also to the U.S. economy. Uh, in the last uh, six months of this year, the Chinese economy recovered very strongly from the recession in the fourth quarter of 2008. And that recovery has been uh, credit-fueled. If you look at the lending numbers in the first uh, six months of the year, total new loans actually tripled compared to the same period last year. We saw this in the U.S., this period of huge loan growth. You're talking about lending into econ an economy where people don't have a huge experience of having credit. So what is the risk there? Well, the risk is that uh, loan growth has been too rapid. Uh, a lot of the new loans, to be fair, in the first uh, six months of this year went into state-owned enterprises and also government-sponsored infrastructure projects. Um, some of the new loans in the recent months have also gone to the consumers, mainly in the form of mortgages. But we're a little bit concerned that the loan growth so far this year has been too rapid. If you look at loan growth, which was 7.4 trillion RMB, that's around 1.1 trillion U.S. dollars. That's half of first half GDP in China. That's a quarter of the full year GDP. I don't think any other country in the world has seen this pace of uh, credit extension. And as you're talking to your clients, particularly Chinese bankers, what are they saying about the quality of credit? Well, so far this year, uh, you can see loan growth has been rapid, but asset prices are also appreciating. So in an economy where the growth rates are high, asset prices are also appreciating, you won't have problems perhaps until a later stage. How quickly are home values going up here? Well, home values have um, increased in the last uh, three to four months. Actually, in the fourth quarter of 2008, home prices plummeted along with the recession that set into the Chinese economy and the global economy. But since then, the Chinese economy has had such a swift rebound, lifting property prices. Transaction volumes in the key cities have reached record levels in the last month. Prices now are also at record levels. Is your sense that this is being fueled by speculation, or is this being fueled by a transition to a homeowning economy? Well, you know, the homeowning economy in China has been emerging for the past uh, 10 years, I would say. Uh, the housing market was first privatized in 1997, and since then, home ownership has really, really gone up. Now, in some of the major cities, home ownership has reached as high as 70 percent. So in the recent months, what we're seeing is, first of all, in January to March, a lot of first-time home buyers came into the market. But as prices started going up, the investors came back as well, both foreign and domestic. 
So you are seeing some speculation. It's not just home buyers. Well, it's not just home buyers. You also have investors who may be investing in the property market for perfectly good reasons. But we are seeing in some of the cities, people are buying multiple homes, five homes, six homes, betting that prices will continue to appreciate. And what are you telling your clients about how to play that? Well, in the last um, six months, we've been recommending property stocks. A lot of the home builders which are listed in China and Hong Kong have done tremendously. Uh, in fact, some of them have gone up in share prices by five times. The Chinese are traditionally huge savers, but now those savings are being invested and fueling a stock market boom. The market has doubled and uh, trading volumes are extremely high. Just to put this in context, in the recent weeks, the Shanghai market has been trading around 50 to 60 billion US dollars per day. The Hong Kong market has been trading around seven to eight billion US dollars per day. So the trading volume in Shanghai is eight times that of Hong Kong which is really unimaginable previously. And you're looking at price to earnings ratios on average of around 15%, is that right, 14, 15%? Well, for Hong Kong, yes, the price to earnings ratio is 15%. In China, it's much higher uh, because um, the market has done much better. So the mainland markets, you have PE ratios around 25, 26 per times on this year, on forward-looking PE. Do you look at that and go, this can't last? Well, you know, the Chinese market has had its ups and downs over the past uh, 15, 17 years. I've been watching the market develop from, you know, the day uh, when the stock market first opened its doors. The Chinese market has always been more volatile than any other market in the world. Uh, P-E ratios vary from 10 times to 60 times. Now, if you look at the more recent history, the index actually reached a high of 6,100 at one point. Now the market is at uh, roughly 3,500. So it's still only 50% of its all-time peak. The Chinese government has some $2.13 trillion in foreign exchange reserves. About $1.3 trillion of that is in U.S. Treasuries and agency debt. Does the Chinese government as an investor influence U.S. policy? Well, you know, China has become more and more assertive um, in the recent uh, one to two years in the international arena, not just with Washington, but in international forums such as the IMF. China clearly is very concerned about the potential debasement of the dollar, uh, a surge in inflation that obviously would lead to a depreciation of the U.S. dollar, given China has lent 1.3 trillion U.S. dollars to this country. Um, however, you know, things don't change overnight. It is very difficult for China to diversify its foreign exchange reserves. China has been incrementally buying more gold. Uh, China's current gold holdings amount to some 1,054 tons. At current prices, that is basically 39 billion U.S. dollars. So is and the objective to slowly get out of dollar investments? How it long is would very it take? difficult. It is very <laughs> difficult. Yeah. So the 39 billion U.S. dollars in gold holdings, that's only under 2 percent of China's total foreign exchange reserves. Also, in recent months, as you might have seen, Chinese imports of commodities from copper to iron ore to aluminum have all reached record highs. As a matter of fact, so far this year, China imported nearly 2 million tons of copper driving up copper prices by some 80 percent. So gradually, I think China will seek to invest in commodities, in gold for sure, but it's very difficult for China to diversify in the near term from its uh, U.S. dollar holdings. This is an essential step in advancing a The Obama administration hosted a summit with Chinese leaders two weeks ago. Do you feel that anything was accomplished there? Well, I think the Chinese side made very clear to Washington that it wants to see the U.S. deficit cut uh, because the U.S. deficits are way too high and uh, the Chinese wants to see that uh, its investments in this country be protected. I mean, that's a shock for the U.S. government to be told, cut your darn deficit. 
<laughs> well, I think the um, politicians have realized it is important for the economy to improve on a sustainable basis. Deficits need to be cut, savings rates need to improve. And I think Washington has also made it very clear to the Chinese side that China needs to boost domestic consumption and stop relying on exports for all of its growth. Could China mm -hmm. enter yeah. an era of isolationism? Uh, no, I don't think China will go back to you know, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, when it was very much an isolated country. Uh, China now is the single largest export, exporter of uh, merchandise goods, bigger than Germany now this year. Now, what's uh, really encouraging is that in recent months, given exports have been suffering a pretty severe downturn, the Chinese government's efforts to boost domestic consumption have really paid off. A lot of the investments have gone into uh, central and western China. We have an interesting program that's ongoing in China called Old for New, for home appliances. So in the recent uh, weeks, we've seen farmers, um, urban residents all trading in their old home appliances for new ones. That's really boosting home appliances. It's been very, very effective. I asked Ulrich where she's telling her clients to invest in China. Certainly, you know, the companies that produce plasma TVs, even personal computers, uh, they're all enjoying the benefits of uh, this program. And you can imagine China has 1.3 billion people. Penetration rates are still relatively low. So the volumes are absolutely huge. Um, uh, cars as well. China has, has its own version of the Cash for Clunkers program. Uh, so, so far this year, China is the single biggest vehicle market in the world. And it's uh, had huge growth in... It has had huge growth. In June alone, uh, Chinese car sales went up 48% year over year. And so far this year, China has also sold the U.S. in terms of vehicles. I think by the end of this year, China probably will sell at least 11 million vehicles, making China the single biggest car market in the world. The Chinese save about 40% of their income. That's eight times what the average American saves. And it's got to change if China wants to unleash its consumers. But Chinese citizens are fearful that there isn't enough social security to go around when they retire. Are you seeing money come out of savings and go into consumption, or are you just seeing Chinese households lever up? How's this going to work? Well, you know, the stimulus program has been remarkably successful. A lot of infrastructure programs almost started right away after the overall four trillion program was announced. So infrastructure programs employ a lot of people. So some of the migrant workers who were laid off from the coastal regions were able to find jobs immediately in the inland regions, building bridges, roads, and railways. So as soon as they regained employment, clearly they had more income, and they were out there shopping. Now, in the inland regions of China, you are seeing home sales, uh, home appliance sales, and even daily consumer goods, apparel, shoes, going extremely strongly, actually stronger than the coastal region. There's a tremendous uh, accumulation of wealth in China, uh, probably much faster than outsiders um, expected. So going forward, I think the growth engine for China will be twofold. One is investments, infrastructure, building plants and factories. Secondly, domestic consumption, especially services, which uh, remain reasonably underpenetrated in the Chinese economy. Interesting. So is that one of the areas that you're telling your clients to invest in domestically? Think about telecom services. Think about the internet, uh, media, advertising. These are very new areas, um, you know, relative new areas in the Chinese economy. Um, also, think about spa services, medical care. In the medical care arena, we're seeing a huge amount of focus by the Chinese government. In fact, the government is spending 123 billion U.S. dollars in the next three years to put in a basic health care system and covering 90 percent of the population. Beijing also pledged to have uh, universal coverage for every single person in China by the year 2020. So medical services, medical equipment, hospital services will remain a high growth area for China in the years to come. Part of the reason that I understand Chinese savings rate has been so high is that the Chinese felt that Social Security couldn't take care of them. 
You know, the high savings rate in China is due to several reasons. Certainly, cultural reasons play a bigger role, um, as well as um, uh, the general concern for lack of um, a social welfare system. So largely, the Chinese uh, savings are precautionary in nature. People have to self-insure against illness. They have to save a lot of money for their retirement and their children's education. But as the central government in China pledges to enhance social services by providing a pension system, health care in the coming years, I think people will end up feeling more secure about their future. They will feel more comfortable spending more and saving less. It will release trillions into the overall economy. I think the Chinese consumer is the one to watch uh, in the future years. If the Chinese government delivers on its promise to provide a social safety net, Chinese citizens may feel less need to sock away their cash, transforming a nation of savers into spenders. That'll unleash trillions of dollars into the global economy. Jing Ulrich plans to be there to help direct the flow. For the record, I'm Margaret Popper.